What does this bead? This Play-Doh and this impression of a horse here have to do with a history of copyright. Stay tuned to find out. Ravis, a librarian at the University of Montana's Mansfield Library. And welcome to the first video for the second unit of Who Owns Culture? An Introduction to Copyright. This will be the first of three videos. It's my goal that by the end of this unit, you will be comfortable explaining two things to someone who knows nothing about copyright. One, how society's definition and view of an author or creator has changed over history. And two, three to four major historical events that contributed to the development of copyright as we know it today. Let's start out with the following question. Who is or was an author and why? Well-known literary critics such as Michel Foucault and Roland Barth have written essays that answered similar questions. When hearing the word author, those of us who are not literary scholars may likely think of someone who has written literature or books like Edgar Allan Poe or J.K. Rowling. When you think of how an author benefits from creating their works, I'll take an educated guess that you likely envision someone receiving royalty checks for their labor and that they own their creations. While this may be a popular interpretation today, do you think authors have always benefited in these ways throughout history? In these first two videos of the unit covering antiquity through the early 18th century, we're going to examine historical answers to the following three questions. One, who is an author and why? Two, how did authors benefit from creating their works? And three, did authors own their creations? This will provide a context for how copyright in Western societies evolved into what it is today. Let's begin by looking at the first documented use of the word author, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. Going back to 1382, this word appeared in the very first English translation of the Bible by John Wycliffe. Wycliffe uses the word author to refer to a lineage of translations and revisions of the Bible, beginning with 72 Jewish scholars translating the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek in the second century BCE. Next, an Egyptian bishop named Hezekius revised that translation in 300 CE. St. Jeremy then translated Hezekiah's revision into Latin, or the Vulgate, in the 4th or 5th century CE. Fast forward to the late 14th century, Wycliffe translated the Latin Vulgate into English. File the Latin Vulgate away for later. That part gets more interesting, I promise. Today, if Hezekiah or St. Jeremy were to revise or translate the Bible into another language, we would typically use more precise terms such as revised by or translated by to describe such activities. Author would not likely be the first word to come to mind for translations or revisions of another's work. Let's go back even earlier and take a quick trip through ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and Rome to see how authors or creators of literature and art functioned in those respective civilizations. About 5,000 years ago, we see some of the world's earliest forms of writing by Sumerians and Mesopotamia. The contents of such writing were not epic poems or histories, but were nonetheless important to illustrating how ancient Sumerians lived. Such writing involved pict pictograms carved into clay tablets that accounted for commercial activities. 
At the time, ancient Sumer was a booming agricultural-based society and written records were needed so people would know who was allowed to use different areas of land for specific purposes. Also, remember the chunky bead and the horse impression on Play-Doh? Don't worry, mine's a copy and not the real thing. In Mesopotamia, these were known as cylinder seals. People used them to sign documents as well as to literally seal storage room doors, jars, and clay envelopes. The use of cylinder seals continued for millennia in this region and even spread to ancient Egypt. Pictograms later evolved into cuneiform in the fourth millennium BCE. Dictionaries, myths, poems, religious texts, and heroic tales such as the Epic of Gilgamesh were written onto a series of tablets in cuneiform dating back to the third millennium BCE. These types of documents were written by anonymous scribes and those who na whose names who have, have been lost to decay. Sargon I's daughter and high priestess, Enedwana, composed hymns and poems for the goddess Inanna in the 24th century BCE. Her name appears in the text as she writes in the first person, and only because she referred to herself in the body of her text, Enedwana is the earliest known author in history. Authors of later texts identified themselves in a similar way. However, many writers deferred to divine inspiration as the true author of their own literature. Artists in Mesopotamia were employed by all levels of society. For instance, Commoners and nobles alike would commission small sculptures of themselves to be placed in temples for patron deities. Kings in this region would commission artists and scribes to record their accomplishments, victories, and histories in sculptures and accompanying cuneiform inscriptions. Important legal and business transactions were memorialized in stone monuments, or stile. In fact, the first documented signed artwork was the Umshumgo Stili from the third millennium BCE. It featured at least two relief sculptures engaged in some sort of transaction along with an inscription. The end of the inscription reads, Enhegal, the creator of the Stili. By today's standards, it's pretty remarkable that the first documented artist in history is known for creating something that we would consider rather mundane, like the deed to newly purchased real estate. Also note that it was a very rare exception that an artist would sign their works. Most artists were viewed as craftsmen or laborers by Mesopotamian society, and the kings in the region would take credit for having built large stile, palaces, or temples. Despite this rich body of cultural items and a robust bureaucratic system, the societies of ancient Mesopotamia did not have intellectual property as we know it today. At about the same time in ancient Egypt, the earliest discovered literature exalted the pharaoh and honored the dead rather than accounted for resources and land. Instructions on how to live a good life or books of wisdom were attributed to royalty. Other literature consisted of letters, narratives, songs, poetry, histories, and religious texts like the Book of the Dead. In addition to performing administrative roles in Egyptian society, scribes were usually hired to copy such texts by a noble or royal patron and had a very respectable place in ancient Egyptian society. Lists of offerings, prayers, and accomplishments of the dearly departed were attributed to royal officials, but likely these hired scribes were the actual authors. Artists and sculptors of the time were viewed as craftsmen or laborers, but still had a respectable place in Egyptian society. They were typically employed by workshops and paid for creating their works with rations, land, housing, and or other resources. The tombs of nobility and royalty very occasionally acknowledged a scribe, artist, or craftsman, 
but this was not the norm. As far as we know, artists did not sign their works. This may have been because ancient Egyptian art followed rather strict traditions and forms. In essence, images and styles were copied. Works of literature were anonymous unless attributed to a member of royalty. Also, similar to the Mesopotamians, there was no concept of literary or intellectual property in ancient Egyptian art or literature. In ancient Greece, poetry and other literature were initially communicated over generations through the oral tradition, including the Homeric literature. At first, ancient Greek authors would never dream of calling themselves or any other individual the author of such works. These works were collectively attributed to their own culture and history. This slowly begins to change around the 8th and 7th centuries BCE. The Greek alphabet was developed in the 8th century BCE and was initially used to label an object with a name or dedication to a deity. During this time, oral tradition, in-person discussion, and performance were prioritized over writing. Poets within the oral tradition would freely borrow ideas and verses from one another without any charge of theft. As writing literature became more prevalent around the 6th and 5th centuries BCE, the notions of attribution to individual writers and even accusations of plagiarism appeared. For instance, the 5th century BCE lyric poet Theognis says the following to his friend Kernos in one of his elegies. Kernos, by me as I practice my art, let a seal be set on these words, and never will they be stolen unobserved. Nor will anyone substitute something worse for the good that is present. And everyone will say, the words are Theognis of Megaras. Among all mankind, he is named. Artists and sculptors were better recognized as individuals in ancient Greece than their counterparts in ancient Egypt. Many were identified by signing their works. One of the earliest discovered artist signatures is Euthycartetus around 625 to 600 BCE. He created a marble sculpture of a young man and dedicated it to Apollo. It's likely that Euthycartetus was either of noble birth or independently wealthy since he knew how to read, write, and could afford the materials and spare time to create the statue himself. So why would he have signed this sculpture? It was likely to promote himself as being religiously pious and to display pride in his creation. Another reason why ancient Greek artists signed their work was due to a culture of competition in their society. Similar to Mesopotamia in ancient Egypt, there was no legal concept of intellectual property in such works. Just attribution to authors, creators, and the fact that one could be called out for the ethical no-no of plagiarism. Greek culture was appropriated by the Roman Republic and later the Roman Empire in the second century BCE. After Greece was added to the Roman Republic in 146 BCE, art was looted and brought back to Rome. This created a demand for replicas. Greek sculpture workshops would create and sell such replicas to buyers around the Roman Republic. Artists and architects were able to make a living from private and state patrons, but they were not often recognized for their work. Usually, the whims of such patrons dictated what was created. According to Eugene Dwyer in the Grove Art Online article on Roman art, Roman sources preserve much information concerning patronage, but little concerning the activity of architects, sculptors, and painters. Roman law expressly forbade the use of an architect's name in the dedicatory inscription of a building, while it demanded, even in private buildings, record of the dedicator or title holder. Such an attitude towards architectural patronage 
is consistent with a culture that valued the thing represented more highly than it valued the representation. Roman writers supported themselves in a number of ways. Some writers amassed wealth through various means and were able to support their literary exploits. For example, Julius Caesar used the spoils of his military victories to support his political writing. The upper class either hired scribes or used slave labor to take dictation to write works. Other writers came from wealthy families and were able to support themselves. The poet Catullus is an example. Lastly, some writers had patrons. For instance, Emperor Augustus's political advisor, Macenus, financially supported a number of Roman poets, including Horace and Virgil. Toward the latter portion of the Roman Empire, we begin to see the concepts of literary and artistic property. A couple of centuries after the Roman capital was moved to Constantinople, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian wrote laws about who owns a work of literature or art in Book Two of his Institutes in the 6th century CE. In literature, whoever owned the parchment or paper upon which a book was written owned the entire contents. In paintings, the artist typically owned the work as well as the board upon which the work was painted. A plain board was typically worthless. So, let's end on that note. In the next video, we'll cover how literary and artistic property was shaped through the Middle Ages and the beginning of the 18th century.